church, Anglican church, is episcopally led and is synodically governed. Major responsibility of all these leaders is one proclamation of the gospel. The empty cross means that Jesus Christ is no longer hanging on the cross. What we call church seasons are also called in other ways the church year, liturgical year, or church calendar. All of those point to the same thing. But because he's the metropolitan, his crozier moves to every diocese and at any time he can decide to visit a diocese. The creeds, especially the Nicene Creed, are sufficient statements of faith for this church. The sacredness of the clerical vestment can be traced back to Aaron and his children. Hello viewers, welcome to another edition of Anglican Ambassador on Anglican Cable Network Nigeria. My name is Phoebe Aguirre Hill. A people without the knowledge of their past history and origin is like a tree without roots. Today we shall be discussing the history and origin of the Anglican Church. And to enlighten us, I have with me in the studio the Right Reverend Dr. Duke Akamisoko. The Lord Bishop is the Bishop of Kubra Diocese in the ecclesiastical province of Abuja. Thank you, my Lord, for coming on the program. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, sir. And so we're looking at the history and origin of the Anglican Church. And I would like you to defend the term church. Thank you very much. Uh, the term church uh, is a Greek word which means ecclesia. And uh, what it means is the call out ones. People are called out for a specific assembly. Uh, and when we say the church, actually among the Greeks and the Hebrews, it did not uh, start with the Christians, actually. The terminology did not start with Christians. Okay. It started with, well, for example, you have a people who are called out for a meeting from a larger crowd to go and assemble somewhere. They call it ecclesia, an assembly, a congregation, a community of people. So right even in the Old Testament, for example, uh, the term church is not addressed, but it's called, the world is called, like the Jews, for example, they are called out people. When they meet together, it is in the context of that, before it comes down to the New Testament. And even in the New Testament, as I said, it is not a Christian word, for example. It's not a Christian terminology, but the Christian adopted it. When Christ came, preached the gospel, and people follow him, and they become a special people, a special called out. So even among the Greeks, among the Jews, even before Christ came, they have people who are called out. But today, uh, some people might think that the term church, well, it has become so popular in a modern day that it is only the church, the Christians, that are known with it. So what it actually means is they call out people who congregate, who have a specific, it might be a political meeting, okay. especially among the Greeks. It might be a social meeting, it might be economic meeting, but for us Christians, we believe those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, we see ourselves as people who are called out, and the church today is specifically uh, addressed to us. Yes. Okay, so it's yeah. not necessarily the building. No, well, well, today again, yeah, today again, if you see a church, it be a building. You might say it's a building. This is a Roman Catholic church building, building also, but in original sense. It's not, it has nothing to do with the building. Okay. Uh, the church has nothing to do with it. But today, people can say this is an Anglican church building, a Roman Catholic church building, but it has not, in the original context, it has nothing to do with building. It's a people okay. who are called out for a specific program, an okay. assignment, either politically, socially, economically, they meet together to decide, a community of people. So, addressing uh, the church, apply it strongly, because when we talk about God's people, for example, the Jews, right from the Old Testament, they were special people called out. It's, they, they are regarded as ecclesia. Okay? A people of God. Then, down through, so 
the term church, but became very pronounced and uh, immediately Christ came and all that. So now, will you say that was when it started? No, the term church? Yes. No, 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 no. This, the, the, as I said, church, what I talk about, ecclesia, it started with, with people who are called out. Okay. And called out people did not start from the New Testament. Right from the Old Testament, we have people who are called out and specifically we address it to the Jews. The Jews who are selected people called out from other people. Like uh, Abraham was called out from his people. He became a church, specially called out. But in the classical sense today, uh, Ecclesia, as we adopt it in the Christian context today, in the modern day Christian, uh, which means uh, believers in Christ. But as I said, it is not a Christian world. Okay. It's, the, the work church did not originate with Christians. All right. Thank you so much, my dear. Yes. Now let's focus on the topic, the okay. history and the origin of the Anglican Church. What gave birth to the Anglican Church? Well, the Anglican Church, as if, if we go back to history, the church started one, when Christ came and he resurrected. And we'll talk about the church right from Pentecost. The church was one. Down through until 1057, the church divided into two. When we divided into two, these two are what we call the Western Church and the Eastern Church. The Western Church has its origin with headquarters in Rome, the Roman Catholic. Then you have the Eastern Church, which you call the Greek Orthodox, the Orthodox Church. Due to some controversies and trouble, the church divided into two with different leadership. Before then, the church was one with the headquarters in Rome. Now, when the church divided, the Anglican, the church divided into one, into two, the Roman Catholic Church with the headquarters in Rome, that is called the Western Church. Anglican Church was part of it. Okay. We're part of the Western Church. That's the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church. church. One church, the, when the church divided into two, two churches, you have the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church. And you talk the West and the East. So the Western Church, which the Anglican Church have its root in, continue as one church. Then there's what we call the Reformation, spearheaded by Martin Luther, 551 AD. Martin Luther himself was a Roman Catholic priest. Due to some controversies and whatever, he broke up from the Roman Catholic Church and founded what we believe his, his members became what we call the Lutheran Church in Germany. Now it is in this control in the 15th century, it is in this controversy, churches were the, moving out from the Western Church. There, the king in, in, uh, in England, Henry VIII, the Roman Catholic uh, person himself, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was also in, in England, was a Roman Catholic prayer, priest. Now he had a problem. His problem was that uh, he had a wife who was not giving him children, male children. And he inherited the wife from his uh, uncle or whatever. And he said, well, this is not his original wife. He didn't take her this wife originally. More importantly, she's not giving him the desired children. children. So he applied to the Archbishop of Canterbury at that particular point in time that please, he want a divorce that to take another wife. And they said, well, it cannot be done until the Bishop of Rome give him permission, the Pope of Rome give him permission. And he applied and it was rejected. Now at this time, churches were having conflict with Rome on different matters, politically, uh, uh, tribal, uh, social, and whatever. Group were divided from the Roman Church. And when he refused, churches were being nationalized to, to their countries. German want to be independent of Rome. Uh, England also said they want to, to be independent. They have not gotten the opportunity, but this opportunity came that they said he cannot divorce his wife. And the Archbishop of Canterbury said, well, if the Rome, if is it because we are under them, mm. we can give you that, uh, that dispensation here. But to do it, we have to excise ourselves 
from uh, Rome, Roman from the Roman Catholic, from Rome. Now they excite themselves. They say, oh, if it is possible, okay. So in 1662, officially, the Roman Catholic, the Anglican, uh, not, we don't, they, there was no Anglican then, we call it the church in England. The church in England broke away officially from Rome, mm. Rome and became independent. And the Archbishop of Canterbury became the head, and the king also became the supreme head of the church. So, in a, in a historically, that is how the church left. Well, even though when they left, they still maintained the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. They still maintained the teachings and all that. But Camera, who was one of the leaders, was assigned with some bishop to bring out some very distinct features that would be different from the Roman Catholic. Catholic. Mm -hmm. So from that, like the Roman, where we inherited seven sacraments, they, 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 reduced, they reduced it, following the Protestant Reformation, spearheaded by Luther to two, and several things were reduced. reduced. So that is how the Anglican Church came out from the Church the of Roman England, Catholic. from the Roman Catholic Church, and became an independent church, with its own priests. Some priests refused to follow. Some of them were killed, some of them were sent away from England because England became one church, Church of England. Yeah. And then it became independent of the Roman Catholic Church. So let me ask you, my Lord, will you say that King Herring's desire had a role to play in achieving God's plan? A lot, a lot. Without that, the priests, the Archbishop of Canterbury will have not, uh, possibly they will have used other means because there were crises at that time. But definitely Herring, the hate spearheaded the broken out from the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, so at this point, we'd like to know, what is the Anglican spirituality? I mean, the distinct way and manner Anglican give expressions to their worship. Yes, when the Anglican came out, and as I said, there was the wave of what we call the reformation, the change, the transformation, the spiritual revival, evangelical revival taking place around the world at that particular point in time which was lacking in the Roman Catholic Church. And the emphasis was the Bible, prayer, and worship. In fact, majorly the Bible, mm -hmm. reading from the Bible, depending on the Bible, and relying on the Bible. So the Anglicans took it up. And because before that time, there was in the Roman Catholic Church, though things have changed now, before that time, you, you, you will not find a priest preaching too much from the Bible. Mm -hmm. So, but this time around, the Bible emphasis was on reading of the Bible, believing on the Bible. Uh, there is a term not really used by the reformers: "The just shall live by faith." Which you live by the word of God, depending on the word of God and relying on the word of God. That also become the, the 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 channel, the root, the confidence on which the Anglican Church rely upon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. this is really getting interesting. Yes. So let's talk about the Anglican Church in Nigeria. Yeah. How did it spread to Nigeria? Now, when it was in UK, in London, now in 17, in 1799, there's a group called a society that came out in the Anglican Church in England, Church Missionary Society, CMS. Okay. Now this group they are a group of clergy and laity. It's like a, a society in the church. Uh, like you have AYF today, you have uh, EFAC, you have uh, uh, Mother's you know, It's a group. Now these people were about 16 clergy and there were eight or nine laity in the Anglican church in London, in a particular church in London. And their focus is that they want to carry mission outside England and specifically to colonies of the British government. First to reach not the indigenous first but to reach because at that, this particular point in time more than half of the war was colonized by Britain yeah. and Britain have workers around the world in their colonies. So these colonies are places where they have European workers. And some of these European workers, the churches did not go with them. They were not, they were just a civil servant, whatever, going. So this CMS 
said they should follow these people with the gospel. And in the following them, they find out that the people, these people are colonizing. Some of them don't, have never heard about Christianity. So, Nigeria inclusive. The British came to Nigeria, was in Nigeria. They didn't come with, the British government didn't come with church. But the people that came were Christians. And who is to give them church? This group felt the need to follow them with the gospel, the CMS, mm. society. In fact, when they wanted to do the, the, the traditional church, they said, no, there's no need. Why are you disturbing yourself? But they said, no, so we have gone, we have followed these people, we we'll find out that even the people there do not even know Christ. They were zealous evangelicals, the CMS. So farm in 1799. It was this group that, that carried the gospel with some people. And they made the first expedition to Nigeria. Uh, and they came in with a very prominent figure, Samuel Ajay Crowder. Mm. Now, the Anglican Church first came to Nigeria in 1843, December 24, by one uh, Townsend, Heron Townsend, okay. a reverend. Heron Townsend. Heron Townsend. Okay, sir. Before we go further, okay. because this is really, really, really interesting, right. I'd like us to go on a quick break. Okay. When we come back, you continue with the history. Thank you. Viewers, you don't want to miss the other part of this program, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Did you know Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? Did you know ACNN reaches out to all African, European and Asian countries? Did you know ACNN produces programs that provide Bible-based solutions to your everyday need? Would you consider partnering with us in order to help us reach out to more souls? Then, become a part of ACNN TV Kingdom Investment Partnership. You can be a monthly or a yearly partner. To subscribe, make your partnership payment into this Zenith Bank account. Account name, Prada Communications Limited. Account number, 10132675322. For more details and confirmation of your Akip subscription, please call plus 234-703-265654. You can also reach us via email. We can reach the world with the undiluted Word of God. It's good to know you are still there and this is the Anglican Ambassador. Just before the break, we are discussing the history and origin of the Anglican Church. And I've been in the studio with His Lordship, the Right Reverend Dr. Duke Akamisoko. Thank you once again, my Lord. Thank you. And just before the break, you mentioned... Ajayi Crowther, Herring Townsend, and CMS Group, how they arrived in Nigeria in December 24th, 1843. Yes. All right, pick it up from there, my lord. Yes, uh, that is the classical origin, the arrival of... Then it was... They didn't come with the name Anglican. They come with the name CMS. Okay. Meaning what? Meaning Church Missionary Society. Okay, yeah. Meaning Church Missionary Society. A society in Church of England that came. So... It was uh, when they arrived, Badagri, it, this uh, 24th December 1843, and uh, fortunately, for the first time, the next day was Christmas, which was not known to people, the indigenous people. And the people said, ah, we have arrived there, we must have Christmas celebration. To the indigenous people, they have never celebrated it before. Before this time, there were no Christians on ground. So, Ajayi Crowder, Heron Townsend, and a few other Europeans and whatever had a service. 
and some people were invited in Badagri for the first time. And uh, 18, December 25th, 1843, there was a Christmas celebration. Very low key, but unique. And the people were seeing it for the first time. So from there, Heron Townsend was not comfortable because Badagri then was the headquarters of where people were set free as slaves. Okay. Uh, Heron Townsend would, was, was not given very good uh, reception. From there, he left to Abekuta. It was Abekuta people that received him. And he settled there and had his church there, first church there in Abekuta. And from there, the Anglic they started doing evangelism. But Crowder himself started evangelizing. He was a priest. And uh, their work was growing, especially in the eastern part. Their work was growing. And uh, until Crowder was sent to the Onitsha area, the Niger Delta area, around 1857. In fact, if you check today, people are celebrating, talking about 162 anniversary of CMS in the eastern area. There is that celebration going on now. Okay. It went there July 27th, 1857. Today exactly is 162 years. Wow. There is that celebration going on around Niger Delta and the uh, Onisha area. The people have the history, they have the record. Krada went there, do a lot of work and extend it to Lokoja area. And the Anglican Church began to penetrate to those areas. Now, the climax of it all was in 1864, when Crowder was uh, consecrated as a bishop. The first black bishop to be so consecrated in Canterbury Cathedral. He was consecrated bishop for, because the work was growing. The Anglican Church was spreading, and they evangelized majorly through schools, hospitals, and through other industrial work among the people. And they were able to get young men, young children through school, through hospital. They were the first people to, to set up hospitals. They were the set up, set, first set of people to establish schools, the Anglican Church. They were the first mission that, though, if you want to go to, before 1843, before the arrival of Erin Townsend, there's Thomas Bridge that came from, it was sent by the Methodists. He came first. He came alone, but he didn't have much uh, uh, materials, instrument to win. Then the, when the Anglican came. That's CMS then? Yes, the CMS. So the Methodists also came. The Methodists came first, the same year. So the work of the Anglican Church was growing through school, through hospitals. Uh, then, when people come to school, they came as traditionalists, especially young people. Through that, they were converted. And the church was growing down to the Onisha area. And then they said, now, this place needs a bishop. Now, to bring a white bishop, the white people were not uh, staying long in terms of health challenges. There are a lot of diseases that were killing white missionaries. Mm -hmm. Just malaria, uh, typhoid. Uh, all kinds of diseases. So, but Crowder can withstand those pressures. Oh, of course, as a black man. As a black man. <laughs> Most of the white people, even Townsend, always go once in a while for treatment in UK. And that time it's by ship. It will take some time. Some, some of them will reach home safely. Some will die on the road. But Crowder was comfortable with uh, this. And then, so there's the secretary of the CMS, Herring Vane. His father founded this church missionary. He was part of the people that founded a church missionary society, Reverend John Vane. He was part of the early people that founded the CMS that carried out this gospel around the world and to Nigeria specifically. So his son, who inherited, who became the general secretary, said, ah, there were recommendations that they say they should consecrate a white man to head the mission in Nigeria. Not only in Nigeria, the entire West Africa. The headquarter then was in uh, Sierra Leone and partly Ghana. And Nigeria was under it. And uh, Heron Ben said, these white people can't withstand the weather, 
they can't withstand the, the various head challenges. It is better. This young man, he was ordained in 1841. He has been there working and working, and uh, he's comfortable you know, and he's used to the people. He can speak the language of the people, he can interact with the people. It was a talk of war because the white missionaries on the field said no, mm -hmm. they will not allow a black man to hold them. And that it is not right for a black man to head to become a bishop. But her in vain impresses it on the queen, impresses it on the king, impresses it on the House of Parliament that the right person for this job, if we want you to succeed, we should give them this black man. When he was consecrated in 1864, the white people protested that they would not be under him. So his diocese was Lagos, where white Europeans are, Abekuta, where white Europeans are, were removed from his diocese. He was only to oversee where black whites are not missionaries. And that is Onicha area, Lokoja area, and some part of Sierra Leone was given to him as his diocese. His headquarters supposed to be in uh, Onicha. But then, it, because of transportation, his family were permanently based in Lagos, but he has no jurisdiction over Lagos because Lagos was dominated by, white. by the whites. And they vehemently rejected the idea of having him as a bishop. So when he was consecrated, he started work, recruited. Uh, uh, the early workers recruited were slaves who were freed from who came from London, from America, and they also have an experience of Christianity. He gave them little training and they were penetrating all over, moving very fast. And they were establishing churches, churches. That is how the Anglican Church continued to spread mm. and spread with the work of Crowder until mm. he died in 1899. What a great legacy left behind. Oh, a lot, a lot. So, Mando, let me ask you, what do you think about the level of commitment to evangelism now as we get Ajay Crowder's time? Well, uh, you know, in Ajay Crowder, the, 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 the situations have changed, the circumstances have changed. Then, you don't have this multiplication of denomination and churches as you have now. Uh, the major denominations at that particular, in the time of Crowder, what Anglican Church, then the Roman Catholic Church came, the Methodists you have, and they are the people, and they, they are major source of evangelizing the people, as I said, is through school, through humanitarian services, through hospitals, and the people who are committed to it, and they do it with great zeal and commitment. And uh, uh, as I said, that time, the challenge was only the, uh, the traditional religion, and the people's we are seeing the difference. If a community accepted Christ, a accepted church, they will see a difference yeah. from that community that didn't accept. So people were willing to become part of the, the church. Uh, the, and the, the workers there, they, they have their challenges. Uh, trouble, challenges of life, challenges of difficult transportation movement, but the commitment was there. And they do it with crazy. Crowder was striking. He has no car. There was no even road for that. He, once in a while, he walked by, walked by the ship to carry him from Lagos down, up and down. So, but they were committed to it, seriously. And then again, there was a little, when the Roman Catholic came, there was a competition. Competition of getting more land. The Roman Catholic came, the, uh, the, 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 the Methodists want to cook on. So there was this heavy competition among themselves. This competition say, oh, oh if you, are you, you say, Anglican half five. The Roman Catholic want to have five too. So that competition, whether for good or bad, helped them to penetrate lands at that particular point in time. Yeah, so what are the other challenges they faced? You mentioned weather earlier on. Oh, weather, uh, so health. You know, health wise, road network. Okay. There were no roads. Road network. Crowder had to, in one occasion, he has to trek when he came to far down to Jeba and his. And his uh, it's a ship broke down. He also trek from that place to Lagos, and it took him six months to reach. Was moved, and there were not that there were road moving around and all that. So the the terrain there was no 
DC road for, for them to move. Money also was difficult because they were getting support from the support, the funding, the salaries of the people. Building of churches was sponsored from UK. Because virtually the people on ground had their peasant farmers. And in fact, again, the missionaries have to help to bring crops to them. Because the people were living on uh, uh, peasant life. And crops like tomato, you have, the, the missionary brought them. Maize, cassava, they were all brought by the missionaries. Those are not the indigenous uh, food to us. So most things, they have to bring them. And the people face a lot of financial challenges uh, with a lot of sacrifices. Their salaries come from London. Their welfare come from London. Uh, even to build churches. One of the areas that uh, started very fast is the Onitsha area, where the people have been able to mobilize resources for themselves. Apart from there, all other areas, they have to bring money from UK to build some of these churches. So money was a great problem, great challenge to the workers on the field. You know, I've learned something from what you said about commitment. Yeah. You mentioned the fact that some of the early missionaries lost their lives. Yeah. You know, what is your advice to the viewers watching us on the need for commitment in the work of evangelism? Definitely, if there's no commitment, the work cannot go on. As you said, even as people are dying, people are ready to come in. Mm. And yes, we see how people today who are committed, but large percentage of us are not as committed as they are at a particular point in time. Because it is the growth, as we said, this diocese of, uh, finally the, the diocese was covered that Nigeria became what we call a province of West Africa, when the victim became very large. But in St. Matthias Day, uh, because the, the work was growing, St. Matthias Day, the feast of St. Matthias Day, on the 24th of February, 1979, already there are about 16 dioceses in Nigeria. The feast of St. Matthias, and that is regarded as the bad day of Church of Nigeria, Anglican Communion. Mm. We celebrate it here, St. Matthias Day, 24th of February, 1979, the province of Nigeria was carved out, okay. out of the province of West Africa, with the headquarters in Ghana, as of that particular point in time. As of this time, by 1979, we have almost 16 dioceses, and it's, even the church in England were amazed of the growth of Church of, of, church of Nigeria, having 16 dioceses. As of that time, even Church of England doesn't have that. So they were very happy to, and the proposal was given for us to have a diocese. Uh, then those dioceses are diocese of Lagos, on the Niger, uh, Niger Delta, Ibadan, Ondo, the diocese of the north, the whole north was one diocese with headquarters in Kaduna. Uh, diocese of Owere, Benin, Ikiti, Inugu, Aba, Kwara, Elisha, Egba, uh, and Ijebu, and Asaba. 16 dioceses were covered, which was very large. So we became Church of Nigeria Anglican Communion on the 5th of St. Matthias, 1979. So that's more like the birthday of, of Anglican, of your well, birthday of uh, Church of Nigeria. Church of Nigeria. Not the Anglican Church anyway, because it has always been there. But the birthday of Church of Nigeria, which is heavily celebrated here in Nigeria today. Okay. So that is about uh, 40 years ago. So what's your take on leaving godly legacies? Looking at the works of Ajayi Crowder his commitment, his sacrifice. What is there for you to say? Well, uh, I think that is uh, what the, the, the Bible is very clear about that. And we can see from the example of Crowder that when we leave, leave legacy behind, which is godly, which is heavenly, the impact will be there forever. Not just living for oneself, not just uh, uh, eating for oneself, but living for others. And as, it, as Christians, is to leave a permanent legacy, touching life, which you have seen in the life of Crowder. Okay, Crowder. And when every Christian today should have that obligation, should have that uh, priority in his life to do that. Mm. Thank you so much, my Lord Bishop. Thank you very much. It's been very, very educative here on this program, discussing the history and origin of the Anglican Church. Thank you. Thank you for taking our time to be with us. God bless. So viewers, history is not everything. But it is a starting point. 
It is a compass we use to find ourselves on the map of human geography. It tells us where we are and most importantly, what we must be. Join me next week as we bring another exciting topic peculiar to the Anglican Communion on Anglican Ambassador. Till then, keep the faith and bye for now.